Praise God. Well, welcome to Wednesday night, Believer's Night. We're glad you're here tonight. Thank you, Lord. 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 Well, this is going to be part three of Confession Series. I think it's the last one. We saw in Hebrews 3.1 that Jesus is the what of our confession? High priest and... Apostle, the sent one of our, he's, he's, he's our example of our confession. He's a high priest at the right hand of the Father, watching over our confession. He uh, watches over his word to perform it, hastens his word to perform it. Glory to God. And we saw that the word confession means to say the same thing as. Amen. And we saw the power of our words and holding fast to what we say, the Word of God, and speaking in line with the Word of God. And then last week we talked about changing the scene, changing the scene and shaping the unseen. Words can change the scenes. Second Corinthians talks about that whatever is seen is what? Temporary, subject to change, that's right. But what is unseen is what? Eternal. eternal, it's not subject to change. And God's word's eternal. Now it will change things, but it does not change. God's word does not change. And we saw that the unseen creative power of God created the what? The world. Hebrews 11.3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed. The word framed, there's Greek words, katarizo, to render complete the world. Unseen things created seen things. This is what Abraham did when God told him, I have made you a father of many nations. Him being a father of many nations was unseen. Amen. 25 years later, he became the father of many nations. Thank God, he became the father of of the nation through which Christ would come. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And through which we have now received salvation. Amen. So two things that speaking God's word will do for us, change the seen and shape the unseen. Amen. So we need to be changing the scene. If you don't like what you see, then change what you're saying about it. Find what God's word promises and release creative power to change the scene. Amen. Jesus was our example. He spoke the unseen and saw it come to pass. Amen. And then we're to shape the unseen. Glory to God. It, what things has God shown you that have not yet to come to pass? Well, then shape it through the words of your mouth. Amen. Shape it. Glory to God. And, uh, you know, the promises of God, you've got to speak them out. You've got to declare them. Amen. And we talked about being proactive rather than reactive. Glory to God. Don't just wait for something to happen, be ready for it. That doesn't mean you anticipate it, but you just, you're ready. Yeah. Amen. You know, I don't ever want terrorist attacks to hit Minnesota, but I'm ready. Yeah. Amen. Glory to God. Well, how are you ready? Well, I've got stuff that if, if need be, if it's going to be hard to get stuff, then I've got stuff for that. I've got some weapons in case I need to defend my wife. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Ready. I don't ever want it to come, but I'm ready. Glory to God. Well, you don't ever want the evil day to come, but the Bible says the 
that you need to put on the whole armor of God so that you're able to stand the evil day. Withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. Amen. So we got to be ready. Amen. All right, enough review. Tonight, for you in the sound booth, the name of my message tonight is Faith Speak. Faith Speak. There is a confession onto faith before there is an ever a confession of faith. Especially where there are contrary circumstances to deal with. I'll give you an example because I had so much wrong teaching or just wrong information, wrong programming about my health. It took me a while confessing unto faith before it became a confession of faith concerning healing. Amen. I was feeding on Kenneth Hagin's books on faith and healing um, <clears throat> uh, and about that time I started developing this long projecting wart on my chin and everybody would say, oh, you got something on your chin. I was at college at the time and I mean, I said, yeah, it's a wart, you know. Well, who wants to burn a wart off of your chin? Okay, you could go there and do that. I mean, they've got stuff now, but back then that's pretty much what they did. They'd burn it off. And then you got a scar there. And so I, I thought, well, bless God, you know, I'm, I'm, stand, I'm reading and studying along the lines of faith and healing. Well, it's time to put it to practice. So I, I went and got five scriptures that I was standing on. I believed I received when I prayed. And then I held fast to my confession. And it didn't disappear right away. I didn't care because I believe I'd taken it into my possession by faith. Amen. And it started out a confession onto faith because I'd never done anything like that before. Amen. But it became a confession of faith. At some point there, it went from, and I'll talk more about that later, but it became a confession of faith. And one day I went to shave and realized I was shaving right over the spot where the wart was and it's no longer there. There's no evidence it was ever there. Thank God. Thank God for his faithfulness. Okay? The confession onto faith is the same as the confession of faith, but the difference is that the word of God becomes a personal word to you. In other words, you get a revelation of that truth. See, I mean, sometimes I think people hear Romans 10, 17 wrong. Anybody can tell me what Romans 10, 17 says? That's right. So then faith comes by hearing, and that hearing by a word of Christ, a rhema of Christ. You know, it makes it sound like just, just hearing the word of God generally. But no, faith comes by hearing a personal word. When the word of God, that's the confession on the faith. You confess the logos of God's word. By Jesus' stripes I was healed. By Jesus' stripes, himself took my infirmities, bore my sicknesses. Thank you, Lord. You know, you said you'd take sickness away from the midst of us. Amen. That you want above all things that I prosper and be in health even as my soul prospers. You know, so on and so forth. You can, you, you, and you, you make those confessions of faith, but until the logos of God's word becomes a rhema, a personal word to you, faith doesn't come. Faith comes when the word of God becomes a personal word. It's not, you know, oh yeah, pastor, he believes in healing. I do. Amen. I stand on it, I walk in it, I believe it, because the word of God, the word of God has become a personal word to me, and I keep feeding on that word. You've got to keep feeding your faith. You've got to starve your doubts to death. 
But just because it works for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you until the word of God becomes a personal word to you. But it only happens out of your mouth. You've got to change what you say. You're going to rise to the level of what you speak. Amen. The hearing here that it talks about, a hearing comes by a ray of God. The hearing here is of the heart, the spirit. You know, you can hear it with these ears, but it isn't going to register until you hear it with your heart. Amen. And that comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing until the word of God gets from your head to your heart. Amen. Do you hear it with your heart and faith for that promise springs up in your heart. Some people struggle with saying the th same thing so much, not, realize, not realizing that they've spoken the negative hundreds of times in their lifetime. <laughs> we have. Whether you want to, you know, if, if you just add God, ask God for supernatural recall, you've spoken the negative hundreds of times. Amen. It takes time. And speaking it over and over until you actually hear it in your heart and faith comes for that promise. This process is called the washing of the water by the word. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Talking about Jesus and the church. Verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Now, first, the first cleansing comes when we hear the word of salvation, doesn't it? And that cleanses our spirit. But then there's more cleansing that's got to happen. You got to cleanse your mind until if your mind is renewed and transformed so that your thinking lines up with God's thinking and your words begin to line up with God's words. That's the washing of the water. See, I mean, the dirt, because it really is. This world is filled with filth and dirt. You know, people don't think that doubt and fear are unclean, but they are. Things that are not in line with God's word are unclean. Amen. Glory to God. And so the washing of the water, it cleanses us from our old stinking thinking the world put in us. This is a process that rarely happens immediately. Sometimes, I mean, you can just, sometimes you can hear something. There's been times where, I mean, I hear something the first time and it's like it just goes from my head to my heart right away. But that's not typical. Now, when we get, out, we, we get into the time where the glory of God's poured out, and we're going to see revelation flow on a daily basis, the word of God's going to become a personal word in greater and greater measure. Amen. Because the workings of God, the Spirit of God, are going to be so much more amplified. Amen. Hallelujah. But right now, it's a process. This process rids us of our doubts, fears, wrong images, and instills right images, hope, and eventually faith. Hope precedes faith. Remember, hope is what? A confident expectation of good things. Hope precedes faith, but it's not faith. It's future tense. Necessary to have for our faith to have something to put substance to. Remember Hebrews 11.1? Turn over to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for. Faith puts substance. There's no substance to hope. It's all in the future. Faith puts substance to things we confidently expect. Amen. Glory to God. So... Faith has to have something to put substance to, and that something is hope. So we need hope, but we can't stay at hope, otherwise there's never any substance. No manifestation. 
Well, how do I know when the confession onto faith actually becomes a confession of faith? Well, there is a recognition on the inside. Turn to Acts, the 14th chapter. Here in Acts 14, Paul's preaching. And there was a recognition. He's preaching in Lystra, one of the cities in Asia Minor. He's preaching in Lystra, verse 8. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Notice, he saw, he perceived that he had faith to be healed. Glory to God. You'll know it on the inside. Glory to God. There was a day with that wart on my chin when I went from a confession onto faith to a confession of faith. And, and, and I really, I think I, I remember, it's been a, been a few years now, but I, I remember that it wasn't very long afterwards that that's when the wart disappeared. The confession of faith takes hope, which is future, and brings it into the now. Faith is always what tense? It's now, it's present tense. Amen. Even 1 Peter 2.24. Remember 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. By his stripes we were healed. Even an accomplished fact by Jesus taking stripes for us must go from past tense to present tense. It's an accomplished fact. You were actually healed 2,000 years ago, but it doesn't belong, it doesn't actually come into your possession or manifestation of your possession until you take it by faith. You've got to take it by faith. You mean receive it. I said take. The word receive that's translated in Mark eleven twenty four is too passive. Too passive. Aaliyah, Josette, and Matt, would you come up here? I need you for an illustration. Our confession declares what was bought and paid for by Jesus is yours slash mine now. Okay? So, um, let's see. Uh, the illustration, Matt, you get to be the devil. Okay? All right. All right. Not the devil's advocate, but the devil. Okay, so you're back here. Okay? Now, let's see, what can I, oh, here, I'll do this. This would be good. Okay? Now, Aaliyah, you've got this bottle of water. Josette is very thirsty. Okay? Now, Josette, I want you to receive this bottle of water from her. Now, Matt, you try to hinder this receiving. Okay? So you go ahead. Okay? Okay? But see, notice, okay, notice if she's very passive, because receiving is passive, right? It is. It's passive. You know, at Christmas time, you receive gifts, right? Well, you don't have to go take them. You just receive them. It's, it's, a, it's a passive thing. She's active in giving, but there's passivity. The, that's why it says in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you take them. I think the translators didn't want to use that word because I think they thought it was too aggressive. But it's exactly what you have to do. Now, instead of receiving, I want you to take that bottle of water as she gives it to you. 
take it. Well, Matt, you've got to try to hinder still. But see, she, she, she's fast. She took it. Okay? Now you try to hinder it, but she's going to take it. But you're not going to be able to hinder it because she's going to take it. All right. Okay? But see, see the difference, you know, receiving is just kind of like, you know, the little bird with his mouth open waiting for mama to bring a worm to her, to the baby bird. But taking means you're alert and you're grabbing hold of that thing and you're pulling it into your possession. That's what faith is for. Thank you for the help there. Glory to God. Now, receiving by faith, there's two ways you can receive. What are they? I'm, I'm talking about actually take, okay? But it, you know, so you, so it comes into your possession, huh? Well, it's, it's always by faith. But there's two ways in faith that you can you can get it from God. You can say it. I'm talking about receiving by faith for yourself. You can say it or you can pray it. If you pray it, you still got to say it. Okay? I already quoted Mark eleven twenty four to you. But still, my standard mode of operating, this is just how I operate is to believe I take it into my possession by faith. I, I believe I receive or believe I take it into my possession. I literally see myself in my eye, through the eye of faith, I see myself reaching into the spiritual realm and taking whatever God promised. I take it, it's mine right then. Not going to have it, you know, uh, you know not, not going to, Take it into my possession. I have it now. But, but manifestations, what's coming? Because you take it by faith, and then the manifestation comes. It says, then you shall have it. Because we need it in this realm, don't we? You know, it's great that, that Jesus died for us. It's great that he, you know, there's so many people that Jesus died for that have never received the free gift of salvation, and they've gone to hell because of it. Amen. It's very sad. But it's the truth. And so we're endeavoring to always get as many of them people aware of that free gift. But they still got to take it. Amen. Well, everything God promised is available to us. It belongs to us. It's our inheritance. But if we don't take it, by faith, it can just sit there. Now, thank God, sometimes through the gifts of the Spirit, you know, God will endow upon us, have mercy on us, and just endow something really where not a lot of faith being exhibited. But, you know, you can't count on that. But you can receive by standing on the Word how many times? Every time. Always. Amen. I mean, you know, thank God when the, when the gifts of the Spirit do kick into manifestation. <laughs> but you can't count it. So my standard mode of operation, I believe, I take it into my possession, and then I say it until it manifests in this realm. I say, because see, then I say, thank you, Lord, I believe I've received, I've taken it by faith, it's mine now. Thank you, Lord. So you've got to say it. You know, now you could just say it. You could just say, well, thank you, Lord, that healing is mine now, in Jesus' name. I'm healed from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, now. You could just say it. But I like the believing I receive, it, it's kind of like a point of contact for me so that I, 
I have a specific time where I've actually done that. That's just me. You do whatever works best for you. Faith is given to us to take what is promised into our possession by faith and then hold fast to our confession until manifestation. The word manifestation means making visible. We need it here. We need healing in our body here. We need finances here. We need, you know, victory over circumstances here. Amen. Glory to God. Now I use the word take because it is a strong, aggressive word that matches the Greek word for receive. To re- me receive is more passive. Take is definitely more aggressive. Glory to God. And so the illustration. So let's talk about faith speak. There were times that Jesus was frustrated with his disciples because he was speaking faith and they just didn't get his faith speak. Turn to John chapter 11. This is one of the most definite examples. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, him whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, talk about a misunderstood passage of Scripture. Now, let's rightly divide this thing. How many of you ever had somebody use this Scripture to try to say, Well, see, their sickness is for the glory of God. Okay? Well, what's wrong with that thinking? Based on this Scripture. Huh? Well, God's not the author of sickness. Yes, we know that. But I'm talking about based on this scripture now. What's wrong with that thinking based on this scripture? Oh, he said this sickness is not unto death. But what did, do, what did Lazarus do? He died. So Jesus is speaking faith speak. In other words, he's saying... Ultimately, this sickness is not going to end up in death. But for the glory of God. He was talking about him raising him from the dead. See, that's why that, you know, people just, they grab this stuff and and run with it without really understanding what they're saying. Amen. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when they heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now why in the world would he do that? He's being led by the Holy Spirit. Because he's about to show forth God's glory. And after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Why did he do that? Why after two days, he knew that Lazarus had died. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews have sought to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. If one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light's not in him. What's he talking about there? Is he talking about daytime and nighttime? What's he talking about? What? Walking in him. In other words, he's saying, hey, I'm following my father's leading. I'm getting light from the father. If God's sending me, if the father's sending me to Judea, then it's okay. He's saying, I'm not in the night. I'm not walking in darkness. God is illuminating me. And so it's going to be okay. These things he said after that, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. (laughs) Faith speak. 
What's he talking? He's talking about the ultimate thing. He said, his body's just sleeping. I'm going to go wake him up. Well, the disciples didn't get it. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. You almost see, hear Jesus sigh, can't you? <sighs> Guys, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let's go to him. See, that's, it's faith speak. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. No, what's he saying? Not that sickness was for the glory of God, but that the end result was going to be the glory of God by him getting raised from the dead. Glory to God. All right? Also, people didn't get it. Turn to Mark chapter 5. He'd speak faith, and they're just like, huh. But there's a lot of Christians today who don't get faith speak. When I used to tell people at Target, I'm catching a healing, they'd look at me funny. Okay. Like, what? That was about the maximum I could do. I wanted to say, well, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed, but they really wouldn't get that. Okay, Mark chapter 5, let's look at verse 22. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, Jesus, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. That's when the woman with the issue of blood came and touched Jesus and she got, he got, she got healed. Amen. And uh, verse 34, he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Notice verse 35 now. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble you, the teacher, any more? Any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid. Only believe. Now, Let's take a lesson from Jairus. What did Jairus say? Hmm? Hmm, he didn't say that. What did Jairus say? Nothing. If you can't say something good, don't say anything at all. He said nothing. And you know, can you imagine? I mean, he's coming, earnestly begging Jesus. You know, my daughter lies at the point of death. You know, if you come and lay hands on her, I know she'll be healed. And the servants come and tell him, don't bother the master any further, your daughter's dead. Okay, now put yourself in that place. All right, I'm not speaking anything. But can you imagine, Jason and Maria, if you had come and you were in the time of Jesus, and Johnny was sick. He's lying at the point of death. You heard about Jesus, you came, and all of a sudden, you know, one of the sisters come and say, well, don't, don't, you mind, don't need to bother him any further. Johnny just died. Can you imagine the state you'd have been in at that point? I mean, that's quite traumatic, wouldn't you say? Any parent knows that's, that's, a, that's not something you ever want to hear. But Jesus turns to him and says, don't be afraid. Now, isn't that an interesting statement? You thought about that? What's there to be afraid of? Well, what are most people afraid of? Death. Hebrews 2, 14, through the fear of death, people have all their lifetime been subject to bondage. He said, don't be afraid, only believe. What did he say? Nothing. He kept his mouth shut. Thank God. 
he believed the best he knew how. <coughs> Part of it is he just didn't say anything. And then, <coughs> verse 37, he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. He came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, saw a tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. Now you have to understand, those days, what'd they do? You know, they weren't quiet at it, like we are when, you know, we're all respectful and quiet. We talk in hushed tones, you know, when somebody dies. Oh, they had mourners. These people would come, oh, just, they'd howl loud. It's like they're professional mourners. They're weeping and wailing loudly. When he came in, he said to these people that were weeping and wailing loudly, why make this commotion and weep? The child's not dead, but sleeping. See, his faith speak. <laughs> and they ridiculed him. King James says they, they put him to scorn. Ha! Who are you? Listen to that knucklehead. He doesn't think we know somebody's dead? He thinks we're making all this noise for somebody sleeping? Who is this guy? What did he just do? Fall off the turnip truck or what? But when he'd put them all outside, see, he's filled with unbelief. Got to get that unbelief and doubt out of there. Put them all outside. He took the father and mother of the child and those who were with him, Peter, James, and John, and entered where the child was lying. He took the child by the hand and said, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked. She was of 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. Glory to God. Faith speak. Child's not dead, but only sleeping. That's faith speak. Glory to God. And he woke her up. God wants to communicate with you in faith speak. Amen. And for you to communicate back to him in faith speak. God is only pleased with faith. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. Impossible. In other words, it's not possible to please him without faith. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Okay? God's only pleased with faith. Why? It's interesting to me that Christian radio stations talk about hope and encouragement. Now, again, I'm not knocking. Don't stop listening to Christian music. I'm just pointing out some interesting observations I've made over time. They talk about what two things? Hope and encouragement. Hope and encouragement. And those are good things, aren't they? We need hope. We need encouragement. But it's interesting. It doesn't say without hope, God, it's impossible to please God. It says without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Amen. Why? That's how He operates. You can't receive from God without faith. That's how you're saved, by grace through faith. That's how you receive everything, by grace through faith. And the devil can't interfere with faith. He tries to get you to drop your confession, change your confession. But if he can't get you to change, he can't stop faith from working. 
He can't stop you from drawing that thing out of the spiritual realm into the natural. He cannot stop it. He can't do it. And that's why he hates faith. He can hinder, interfere, and even stop answers when people are in the realm of the five senses, the mental realm, the emotional realm. But when you're in faith, speaking faith, believing with your heart, he can't interfere. And that, that pleases God because you get what? You get answers. You get answers. Turn to John 15. The Gospel of John, the 15th chapter. This is the first scripture I ever meditated on and memorized. John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. Now notice, by this, <clears throat> by this, Getting what you desire is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. He's talking about getting answers to prayer. He's talking about prayer fruit, getting answers, receiving from God. God is blessed when you receive from Him. God wants you to receive from Him. See, religion has painted this picture of God like he's up there withholding. It's kind of like, well, you know, I wouldn't want to give you too much because you, 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 know, you, you, you might get a, a, you know, greedy or something. Well, yes, you can get that way, but God is pleased. Now, sometimes our kids get a little self-centered during Christmas. Was, do you withhold presents because of that? No. Are you pleased to be able to give to your kids? Are you pleased when your kids get blessed? Amen. Well, God's a better parent than you are. And he gets blessed when you, get, when you receive, when you get answers. And give him the glory for it. He gets blessed. Amen. Herein. Or by this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. God wants you to get prayer and prayers answered. That kind of fruit pleases God. Amen. He, he provided these things for us so we could have them. Amen. Look at Luke 18. Luke, the 18th chapter. Look at verse 8. I tell you, this is talking about the parable of the unjust judge, but I'm not going to get into that. I don't have time. But verse 8, he says, Jesus says, I will tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? What's he going to be looking for? People who dare to believe him. Why do you think he told Kenneth Hagin? When he raised him up off a deathbed, you know, curable blood disease and a heart condition that doctor said he wouldn't live past 15. He told him, go teach my people faith. When Jesus comes back to the earth, it is faith he's going to be looking for. The world teaches us to speak our problems. Faith speaks the answers. The world teaches us to speak how we feel. Faith teaches us to speak what we believe from the Word of God. Faith, the world teaches us we can have good days and bad days. Faith only has good days, some more challenging than others, but they're only good days. This is a day which you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. It teaches us that, you know, the world teaches us circumstances overcome us. It's just a fact of life. Faith teaches us to overcome the world and its circumstances. 1 John 5, 4. This is a victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. According to the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. Somebody was asking me about the seven churches of Revelation the other day. 
What does God expect from every believer? He that overcomes. He expects us to overcome. He doesn't expect us to be overcome. He expects us to overcome. Overcome means there's a fight. But it's a good fight of faith because we win. 1 Timothy 6.12 And then it also says, And you have confessed a good confession before many witnesses. It's because we speak what God says and speak in line with what God says. The world teaches us we have to suffer sickness, disease, lack. Amen. The curse of the law. And we have little recourse. Faith tells us Jesus suffered all those things so we don't have to. Amen. Faith speak is a better way of speaking and a better way of living. Faith speak. It's just the way to go. Glory to God. And so let's, let's begin to, to gauge our mouth with faith speak. Don't speak your fears. Like Lester Sumrall, the great Indiana preacher said, you know, doubt your doubts. Starve them to death. Feed your faith with the word of God. And then let that word come out of your mouth. And only speak in line with that word. Amen. We're going to go ahead and receive our offering tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, you're so good. Thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. Thank you, Lord, that we're walking in your abundance. Father, right now we just thank you for this offering. We thank you for showing each person what you'd have them to do. Thank you, Lord, for the grace to give for each person here in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed to that said... Amen. If you make out a check tonight, make it out to Eternity Church of Market EC. If you're giving cash, you want a tax deductible receipt, raise your hand. While they're actually give you an envelope, just keep your hand up until they get to you. What's happening Sunday? Joseph Morris is here Sunday morning, Sunday night, talking about end times. I was reading something in the Epic Times newspaper that we get, conservative newspaper. Do you know that if you go to, China has a search engine, I can't remember the name of it, and it starts with the letter B, but anyway, uh, if you go to that search engine and you look at the Middle East, guess what's missing on that Middle Eastern map? The nation of Israel. It's not on there. you know that they put over 100 million into those terrorists that attack every year into those terrorists that attack Israel? They don't like Israel. They're going to be the ones that come there in the, in the battle of Armageddon. They're going to be the primary army that's going to come and attack Israel. And God's going to intervene along with us. We're going to come. Jesus is going to destroy them with the sword of his mouth. Amen. Glory to God. So this, the end times is getting interesting. Hallelujah. But uh, come and uh, receive Sunday morning and Sunday night at 630. Glory to God. Let's stand then. Let's present our tithes and offerings to him. Say it out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, bring my tithes. I give my offerings faithfully because I believe your word. I act on your word. I receive the benefits of that word. Press down, shaken together and running over. Abundance is coming to me. Overflow is coming to me. More than enough's coming to me. The blessings of God coming upon me and chasing me down. In Jesus' name. Amen.